السلام عليكم everyone this is uh, Dr. Ma'moon Ahram um, I'll be teaching you with Dr. Walhan Shaer the molecular biology part of the cytology and molecular biology course I'll be speaking mainly in English uh, I'll try to be slow um, if you do not understand anything you can send me messages via e-learning uh, I'd rather that um, you don't send me messages or emails uh, on Facebook or Messenger or email, whatever. Um, otherwise, um, it will be flooded. And I hope for everyone to um, benefit from your questions and my answers. So uh, we will make things public. I think it's more efficient and more useful for everyone. You can um, visit me at my office. My office is in the first floor, uh, the main building of the School of Medicine. Um, I'll be free mainly in the afternoons. You can uh, ask Dr. Shair um, for his office hours. His office is in the Cell Therapy Center. Um, so um, he will let you know when you can see him. Um, so let's start uh, just describing ourselves. Um, I'm the one on the left. Uh, that's me. I'm sure you've seen me around. Uh, to the right, the handsome doctor is uh, Dr. Walhan Shar. Okay, so that's us. So now, um, in terms of resources for this course or the lectures, mainly the main resource is the lecture itself, whatever I say. Um, now you can, if there's something you don't understand, you can refer to the main textbook, which is the Cell A Molecular Approach by Cooper. Um, it is an excellent textbook. Unfortunately, it is not available at the bookstore, but you can download a PDF copy uh, from the net. Um, so for this lecture, you can refer to chapters two, four, and six and these are the pages so for every lecture i'm gonna specify which chapter and uh, what pages you can uh, read what's nice about the book is that the figures are very informative and the legend that is the description of the figure is detailed uh, to the level or extent that you don't have to um, read the text itself sometimes it's just um, the legend itself uh, would be enough. This is the outline of our lectures. We will start with a couple of slides introducing the molecular dogma of molecular biology. We'll talk about nucleic acid structure uh, in this lecture, and then we'll talk about a few applications. We will introduce the human genome, with the structure of the human genome. We'll talk about the process of DNA replication. Uh, we'll talk about mutations and repair then transcription and regulation of transcription we'll talk about a few techniques um, and then we will end, end our uh, topics with uh, translation and the regulation of translation <clears throat> so let's start um, there are two types of nucleic acids and these are the deoxyribonucleic acid also known as dna and ribonucleic acid known as rna now nucleic acids are polymers so let me uh, uh, define what polymers are. Well, if you look at a human body or human cell or anything in nature, there are four types of macromolecules. That is, we're talking about large molecules. These are nucleic acids, proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids. Now, three of these, specifically nucleic acids, proteins, and carbohydrates, are polymers meaning that they are composed of repeated units known as monomers so you have um, for for nucleic acids for example it's a polymer of nucleotides that is you have a nucleotide that is attached to another nucleotide which is attached to another nucleotide so basically it is a chain of nucleotides linked to each other forming a polymer lipids are not polymers they are macromolecules but not polymers so let me introduce what molecular biology is so molecular biology is a fancy word or definition or term for biochemistry 
So it's really biochemistry, except that it deals with DNA and RNA. Okay. Molecular biology describes the molecular processes that take place in cells. Um, now, it's different than genetics. Genetics uh, deals with inheritance of phenotypes. Uh, it deals with genetic diseases that occur at the level of uh, chromosomes, for example, when you have uh, uh, chromosomal defects, for example. Well, that's genetics, basically. Uh, there is an overlap between molecular biology and genetics, but molecular biology is like basically zooming into the molecules. Um, so it's, a, it's a, um, amplified or um, zoomed um, genetics. Now, the central dogma of molecular biology, and what we mean by dogma is aqide, uh, or the philosophy, the main philosophy of molecular biology, describes the processes of DNA replication, transcription, and translation. So basically, DNA replication is making a copy, another copy of DNA, making DNA out of DNA, using a, an enzyme known as DNA polymerase. Okay, now we can use DNA to make a copy of an RNA molecule and this is known as transcription and the enzyme that is responsible for this is known as RNA polymerase. RNA can be used to make or synthesize proteins uh, via a process known as translation using ribosomes as well as other molecular components. So this is the central dogma of molecular biology. Well, since then, you can say that it has been expanded whereby uh, it, by where we have understood a lot of uh, processes that take place inside cells. So, um, in addition to DNA replication and transcription, we have something known as reverse transcription which is a process by which we can make DNA out of RNA. So we use RNA as a template to make a DNA molecule. The enzyme required for this process is known as reverse transcriptase. Okay. In addition, an RNA molecule can be used as a template, that is, it can be copied to make a, another copy of an RNA uh, in a process known as RNA replication. The enzyme needed for this process is known as RNA polymerase. Okay? Now, and it's reversible as well. Now, the thing is, uh, this takes place in, in our uh, cells. This process, the basic process, takes place in our cells. Now, this takes place mainly, uh, that is, uh, reverse transcription, or the RNA replication takes place in viruses. So this takes place in our cells, DNA replication, transcription, and translation. Now the additional processes, that is um, making uh, DNA out of RNA or making a copy of RNA from an RNA, this takes place mainly in viruses. Like the coronavirus, for example, this is an RNA virus. Its uh, genome or its chromosome is actually an RNA molecule, not a DNA molecule. Uh, also, the HIV virus, uh, the genome of the HIV virus is also an RNA molecule. Okay, so um, and these viruses are known as retroviruses. Okay. So nucleic acids are linear polymers of nucleotides, which are the monomers, as I said, and there are four of these monomers or four of these nucleotides that make up DNA, uh, adenine, cytosine, thymine, and guanine. Now, the thing is, DNA is a double-stranded molecule. We'll talk about the characteristics of DNA right now and it can be folded or packed into a coiled DNA when you have a large, um, this large structure of DNA um, as a single unit, it's known as a chromosome. OK, 
Okay, and I'll define what the, the difference between uh, chromosome and DNA uh, is. Now, as I've said, so nucleic acids are polymers of nucleotides. So let's talk about nucleotides. Nucleotides are basically composed of um, three components. You have a sugar right here, that's one. You have a nitrogen out space, and then you have a phosphate. So let's talk about the sugar first. Now, the sugar is a pentose, meaning that it is a five carbon sugar. Um, so carbon number one, carbon number two, three, four, and five. Now, specifically, it's known as a ribose or a deoxyribose. Deoxy means menzoyl oxygen, and it does not have oxygen. So ribose, if it is a ribose sugar, is the one that exists in RNA, and that's why it's known as ribonucleic acid. Whereas the deoxyribose exists in DNA, and that's why it's known as deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA. So the difference here is that in the ribose sugar, you have a hydroxyl group at carbon number two. Okay, same thing with the oxyribose. So right here, instead of OH, you have an H. Okay, now these numbers are really important for you to know. Okay, specifically uh, numbers five and three. So this is the sugar. Now attached to the sugar, to the carbon number five, you have a phosphate group. Okay, and this phosphate group is negatively charged. So you can imagine if you have a DNA molecule that is, or an RNA molecule that is made of a lot of nucleotides, you can imagine the number of negative charges that DNA or RNA would carry. So it is a highly negatively charged molecule. Okay, now let's talk about the bases. There are two types of bases. These are known as purines and pyrimidines, and they are attached to carbon number one uh, via a bond known as a glycosidic bond. Now, as I said, if you have a DNA molecule or an RNA molecule with a lot of negative charges, uh, that would create sort of like repulsion, uh, and it makes the molecule a bit unstable because of the repulsion between the negative charges. If we add positively charged ions like uh, magnesium ion or sodium ions, these would mask or bind to the negative charges of the phosphate, masking the negative charges and stabilizing the molecules themselves. Now, in, uh, in our cells, in eukaryotic cells, um, DNA is complex with proteins known as histones. And these histones are positively charged proteins that also neutralize and stabilize DNA. So let's talk about the bases now. So there are two types of bases. We have the pyrimidines and the purines. And this is how I remember, you know, uh, this is how I link the name to the structure. So purines, that is the little word, refers to the large structure, to the double ring structure. Now, pyrimidine, which is a large word, refers to a small structure, a single ring structure. Now, pay attention that every atom is also numbered right here. So how can we differentiate between numbers of atoms in uh, nitrogen bases versus sugars? Well, these are known as, for example, number one, two, three, four, five, etc. And the same thing here, one, two, three, four, five. Okay. But if you look at the numbering of the sugar itself, notice that there is this sign right here. And this sign indicates uh, the word prime. So this is known as one prime, two prime, three prime, four prime, and five prime. Okay, so this is how we can differentiate the numbers between the sugars and the bases. So let's look at now the purines and the pyrimidines. You are not required 
to know the differences between the different purines and the different pyrimidines. So I'm not going to ask you what the structure of adenine versus guanine is or cytosine versus thymine versus eosine. Okay, so let's let's have this clear. So if you look at the purines, for example, there are two types of purines. These are known as adenine and guanine. The difference between them is that with adenine, you have an amino group, whereas for the guanine, you have this ketone group right here. If you look at the pyrimidines, there are three types, cytosine, thymine, and uracil. Again, notice the differences between cytosine and uracil because that's really important later on. Cytosine has this amino group and uracil has again a ketone group. Now thymine looks like uracil except that it has a methyl group on the side. So now adenines and guanines exist in DNA as well as RNA. Cytosine also exists in DNA and RNA, but thymine exists in DNA only, uracil exists in RNA only. Yes, it says here, and some RNA, but these are exceptions. Um, so the rule is that thymine exists in DNA. Okay, so now, pay attention throughout this lecture um, about the differences between DNA and RNA, and I'll get to that as well. Well, here we go. So these are the differences between DNA and RNA. In general, in general, and I, emphasize on the word in general. DNA is a double-stranded molecule. It's made of two strands. RNA is a single-stranded molecule. DNA has a deoxyribose as the sugar. RNA has a ribose. So we look here, you have an H. Here you have a hydroxyl group. Another difference is that uh, thymine exists in DNA only, whereas uracil exists in RNA only. Now, cytosine, adenine, and guanine exist in both DNA and RNA. Now, we have two terms that you need to know. That is nucleosides and nucleotides. A nucleoside is a molecule that is made of a sugar, whether it is ribose or deoxyribose, and a base. Now, a nucleotide has the sugar and the base plus one phosphate group, two groups, or three groups. So this is a nucleoside. Now, if I say nucleotide, you know, in this case, that this is a molecule that has a sugar, base, and a phosphate. But we wouldn't be able to know if there are if there is one phosphate group, two groups, or three groups, okay? But if I say a nucleoside monophosphate, you know it's a nucleoside, it has a sugar and a base plus one phosphate. So now the name is very clear. We can say nucleoside diphosphate if there are two phosphate groups, and we can say nucleoside triphosphate, just like ATP, okay? Adenosine triphosphate. So let's get into the naming of these nucleotides. We'll start with right here. So here we have an adenine as a base. When it is attached to the sugar, that is, we're talking about the nucleoside, it is known as adenosine. Right? If I attach a phosphate, it's known as adenosine, that is nucleoside, adenosine monophosphate. Or we can say simply adenylate. Okay? Now look at guanine right here. Same thing, guanine attached to a sugar. Now it's known as guanosine. That's the nucleoside. The nucleotide that contains a phosphate is known as a guanylate or guanosine monophosphate to be very specific. Same thing here, uridylate and cytidylate. Notice here that these nucleotides are the ribose is a ribose, not a deoxyribose. The sugar is a ribose, not a deoxyribose. So 
as you can uh, imagine that these nucleotides exist in RNA not DNA now we can use symbols for each one of them so for adenylate we can simply say A or AMP G U and C for uh, cytidine monophosphate well if you look at uh, the other nucleotides that contain the deoxygenated sugar that's deoxyadenosine as a nucleoside or we can say DA um, or simply we can say A I'll, I'll tell you how we can do that um, it's deoxyadenylate for if it's a guanine in uh, as a base we say this is deoxyguanylate or deoxyguanosine monophosphate, deoxythymidylate, and deoxycytidylate as well. So the difference here is that we have a T here conjugated to the deoxygenated sugar or uracil conjugated to the oxygenated to the ribose sugar. Note the abbreviations for each one of them. C, T, G, A, and so on. Now, remember those numbers that I told you about, five and three, or five prime and three prime. Okay, so these are nucleic acid polymers, meaning that you have nucleotides attached to each other. So you have a nucleotide attached to another nucleotide, a third, a fourth, and so on. The linkage the bond between these nucleotides is known as phosphodiester bond and and it is between carbon number three with carbon number five mediated by the phosphate group okay now notice something the top of this polymer has a five prime carbon with a phosphate only now the bottom has a carbon carbon number three the three prime carbon every time I want to make this polymer longer I would add another nucleotide specifically to the to carbon number three so basically and this is the 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 other end uh, the five prime end would be untouched and that is why when we talk about these polymers, we, talk, we say that these have ends, okay? They have ends, and these ends are known as the five prime end and the three prime end. So every time we want to add a nucleotide to make the polymer longer, we add it to the three prime end of the molecule, forming a phosphodiester bond, okay? Now, notice here to the left, we have a polymer. Is it DNA or RNA? Well, if you look closely, there are two things that can help you out. The first thing is that you look at the sugar. Is it a ribose sugar or is it a deoxyribose sugar? Well, in this case, it is a ribose. So that's an RNA molecule. The other hint that tells you that this is an RNA molecule is that if you look at the bases, it contains uracil okay now if you look at the one to the right notice that the sugar is a deoxyribose that's one and there is a thymine um, in this polymer so you know it is a DNA molecule okay now if I bring you a structure of a nucleotide and I ask you what this nucleotide is okay now the first thing you need to know or to do is that you look at the sugar and you say to yourself well is this a ribose or a deoxyribose that's one two you look at the phosphate is there a phosphate or there is no phosphate if there is a phosphate that's a nucleotide monophosphate or diphosphate or triphosphate if there is no phosphate, you know that we're talking about a nucleoside. Then you look at the base and you say, is it a purine or is it a pyrimidine? Okay, so there are two purines, guanine and adenine. And there are three pyrimidines, 
uracil, uh, thymine, and cytosine. Now, this is how you can uh, rule out what's wrong in the answers and you choose what's right and it should be straightforward. Again, I'm not gonna uh, ask you to differentiate between the different purines and the different pyrimidines. Now, if I tell you, look at the molecule to the left and I tell you, well, what is the sequence of this molecule? That is, what I mean by sequence is, what is the order of nucleotides in, in this polymer? So you say it is adenine, cytosine, guanine, and uracil. Now, or you can say it's A, C, G, U. You do not you do not list the nucleotides from the other end. You do not say it's U, G, C, A. Why? Because it just it has become conventional that you start with a five prime end all the time. Just like in proteins, you start with the N terminus, okay, and you end up with the C terminus. So there is directionality. So the sequence of this polymer is A, C, G, and U. What is the sequence of this DNA molecule? It is T, G, C, A. Now notice that I do not have to say deoxy T, deoxy G, deoxy C, deoxy A. Why? Because my question is, what is the sequence of this DNA molecule? Now, once I specify that it's a DNA molecule, I don't have to say deoxy. It's just given that the sugar must be a deoxy ribose. I hope that this is clear. So let's talk about DNA structure now. DNA structure has been um, uh, revealed or it has been identified by two scientists known as Watson and Crick. This is Watson right here. He was a young man at that time, 1953. He's still alive. And this is Crick. Um, and in their scientific paper, they only published this figure that is shown in here, uh, which is something that I do not myself know how to uh, look at or interpret. But from this figure, they were able to draw the structure of DNA, and that's why they got the Nobel Prize. So let's talk about the DNA structure now, the Watson and Crick model of uh, DNA. We say that it is a double-stranded molecule because if you look at it, it's made of two strands and these two strands interwine around each other. They go around each other, okay? Notice that this winding is not really perfect. That is, there's an angle uh, to the, uh, to the um, rotation of the DNA molecule. Okay, so that's one. So it is a double-stranded molecule, or we say it's a double helix, because it looks, it's helical, metal zumbarak, like a spring. Now, notice something, that right here, we have a, a stretch right here of phosphate sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, and perpendicular, almost perpendicular, Amudi. On this chain right here, you have the bases. Now, and you have these bases on both sides of the ring, or of the chain right here, and there is hydrogen bonding between these bases. So, and this hydrogen bonding is very specific. Whenever you have a, whenever you have a C on, on one chain, count, opposite to it you have a G. So there's this CG or GC pairing. Whenever you have an A, it pairs with a T all the time. So here's A, T, T, A, C, G, G, C, and so on. So pairing is very specific. So Whenever you have a purine on one side, you have a pyrimidine on the other side, and vice versa. That is, the opposite is true. 
And that is why we say that base pairing is complementary, meaning that they complete each other. They complete each other. So whenever there's an A, there's a T opposite to it. Whenever there's a G, there's a C opposite to it. So we say that, that the two strands are complementary to each other. As I said, you have a backbone, and the ba this backbone is basically the phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, and the side chains, which are the bases, which extend um, outward. In fact, if you look at uh, how they are oriented or how they are positioned, they are positioned inward. So they, the bases lie inside the double helix, the helical structure. They are hidden inside the molecule. Something else that is important about this DNA structure is that the two strands are anti-parallel, meaning that you have this strand right here, uh, from top to bottom, it's five prime, and in the bottom, it's three prime. And the complementary strand, if you look at the top, it's three prime, and in the bottom, you have the five prime. So the two strands are anti-parallel to each other. So let's, talk, let's review this information. So we have something known as the Chargaff's rules. Uh, Chargaff was a scientist who said that he, he noticed that whenever that the number of A is always equal to the number of T in any DNA molecule and the number of G is always equal to the number of C in a DNA molecule and the number of purines is equal to the number of pyrimidines but the number of A and T is not necessarily the same or equal to the number of G and C so you can have a DNA molecule that is mainly composed of, of A's and T's, okay? And very little G's and C's. So you don't have to memorize this drawing right here, but just to emphasize that um, the, the bonding or the base pairing, we say base pairing between A and T is via two hydrogen, bo hydrogen bonds versus three hydrogen bonds between G's and C's. We say that DNA is complementary. That is, whenever you have an A, there is a G opposite to it. Whenever you have a G, there is a C opposite to it, and so on. Okay? So they complete each other. And we talked about the backbone. And the backbone, Al-Ambud al-Faqari, the backbone of the molecule is basically phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, and so on. And the side chains are the bases themselves, which are, which are oriented inward in a DNA molecule, as I said. And we said that DNA is an anti-parallel molecule. That is, the two ends are uh, opposite to each other. So this molecule runs from five to three, and the complementary strand runs from three to five. Okay, now remember something. If I tell you what is the sequence of this DNA molecule to the left, you say it's A, C, G, T. So you have to start from the five prime end all the time. If I ask you what is the sequence of the molecule to the right, you do not say it's T, G, C, A. Rather, you have to say it's A, C, G, T. Again, you have to go from five prime end to the three prime end. Unless you specify which end you're starting with. So you can say the sequence is three prime, T, G, C, A, five prime. But this is really not, uh, you, you will not find it um, in, in textbooks but you will find it in my exams though. So pay attention to that. All right, so here's DNA. It's double-stranded, and we say the sequence of DNA is A, T, G, G, C, C, etc., starting with the five prime end. And this is the complementary strand, okay? Now, in many textbooks, exams, uh, papers, whatever, you do not have to, to, to write down the sequence of both strands. You can only 
uh, just refer to the sequence of, the, of one of them starting with the five prime end all, all the time because once you have one of them it's given what the sequence of the complementary strand is so right here it's a t g c c etc you know that this is the five prime end which starts with a and it ends with t t c a and here you have the three prime end now the complementary strand to it starts with the five prime right here to the right and you say it is t g a a g t etc okay so by referring to only one of them if you say it's dna it's given that it is a double stranded molecule if you have the sequence of one strand you should be able to tell what the sequence of the uh, next the complementary strand or opposite strand is now this is an RNA molecule again if you look at it um, uh, it's uh, you 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 state the sequence of the RNA molecule starting with the five prime end so it is a u g g all the way to the three prime end you know it is an RNA molecule because there is a u um, in in the sequence DNA is a flexible molecule, yet it is stable. It's like an electrical wire, okay? So you can bend it easily, this, uh, this wire, but can, can you stretch it um, so hard that you can break it or cut it? No, it's really difficult. Same thing with DNA. DNA is a flexible molecule. It can be bent, but it's, uh, it cannot be easily broken. Now, when I talked about the helical structure of the DNA molecule, I said that the helical structure is really not that uh, perfect. Okay, so it's not like a spring, Zumbarak, um, it, whereby it is straight molecule. Rather, it has an angle to it. And as a result of this imperfect helical formation of DNA, you have what is known as grooves right here so this is a groove you can um, it's like Jora Hofra okay so here's a groove right here now notice that opposite to this groove you have another groove okay and notice the difference in size here the, this groove is large and here the groove is small now what follows on one side what follows a large groove is a small groove okay here you have large small large small look at the opposite side you have small large small large and so on now these grooves are known as the major groove and the minor groove now the question is what is the significance of these grooves well the way we function is that you have proteins and this is the structure of a protein on top of an, a DNA molecule. Now proteins interact with DNA, okay? And this interaction is very important. Now when proteins interact with DNA, they prefer to interact with DNA at the major groups, okay? So the protein inserts itself inside the major groove because now because there is enough space for it to insert itself inside okay um, interactions can take place in the minor groove but primarily interactions take place uh, at the major groove now the interaction takes place between the amino acids of the proteins as with the bases of the um, dna molecule Okay, and this interaction occurs via non-covalent interactions, the four of them, hydrogen bond, electrostatic interaction, van der Waals interactions, and hydrophobic interactions. Okay, now, so basically in prokaryotic cells, uh, they do have a DNA, it's a single strand molecule that is actually not a strand, it's a circle, so it is circular. In eukaryotic cells, um, 
DNA is composed into different strands of different lengths and they are enclosed they are surrounded by or they are placed in a nucleus surrounded by a nuclear membrane okay so this is why they're known as you Karyots. U means real, true nucleus, uh, whereas uh, prokaryotes is uh, it, it means that it does not have a nucleus. Okay. Now in eukaryotic cells, and that's what we want to focus on, um, the length of our DNA molecule in a single cell is almost like two meters. So these two meters or this two meter molecule, the DNA molecule, must be packed inside a nucleus, which is really a task that is very tough. So you can imagine, well, how can we package DNA inside a nucleus? Uh, to use an analogy, it's almost like you have a rope, habil, that extends from the University of Jordan all the way to the airport. We're talking about 35 kilometers, okay? So we have this rope and we want to package, we want to insert this rope inside a yellow tennis ball. So it is an amazing task. And this is done by wrapping DNA around proteins known as histones. I said before that histones are possibly charged proteins. So what they do is that they interact with the phosphate groups of the nucleotides. And you have DNA that is packed around histones. Okay, this is known as a chromatin molecule. That is, whenever you have a DNA molecule um, uh, bound with proteins, that's a chromatin molecule. Now, so let's talk about these histones. Okay, so we have these histones in yellow and you have the DNA in red wrapped around them. So you have, so it looks something like beads on a string, So basically here you have DNA wrapped around histones and then you have a free DNA, a DNA that is free of proteins or histones. And then you have another bead or another histone molecule with DNA wrapped around it. Okay, and so on. Now, this structure that is composed of the histone plus the DNA that is wrapped ar around it plus the DNA that is free of histones, which is known as the linker DNA, this, is, this structure is known as nucleosome. Okay, so the structure of nucleosome is basically the histone molecule with the DNA that is wrapped around it plus the linker DNA, okay? Now, if you look at the histone molecules, these histone molecules are actually, or this, this structure right here is made of eight histone molecules. And there are four types, two of each. And these are known as the H2A, H2B, H3, and H4, okay? So you have two of each, and they form a structure that is an octamer. Octa means eight, okay? Now, one would say, well, how about uh, histone one? Well, histone one is sort of like it seals the structure, this structure right here. So whenever you have an octamer, plus the DNA that is wrapped around the octamer, histone one comes in and it seals this structure. So a chromatosome does not contain the linker DNA or it, it does not involve the uh, linker DNA. Okay, so that's the difference between chromatosome and nucleosome. So the idea again here is that we have DNA that is double-stranded and this DNA folds around or it wraps around histones, the octamer right here, that's the octamer. Okay, so this here is a nucleosome, the DNA around histones, the histones themselves, and the free DNA, the linker DNA, that's a nucleosome. Now, when the DNA is packed very, very, very tightly, you have histone one 
associated with these structures with hardly any linker DNA and this is known as the uh, chromatosome. Okay? When you have a single large molecule of DNA plus the histones and it's a single unit, this is known as a chromosome right now. Okay? So there are a number of terms that you need to know. Now, many students ask me what the difference is between DNA, chromosome, gene, and chromatin, let's say. Well, as I said, chromatin is basically the combination of DNA and proteins. DNA is, um, DNA is this structure right here. It's just a strand of DNA uh, composed of nucleotides. Okay. Now, when, these, when this DNA is wrapped around histones into a large unit, this is known, this large unit is known as a chromosome. Chromatin is part of a chromosome. It's this section right here that contains DNA plus proteins or histones. A gene is basically a stretch of nucleotides, okay? A stretch of DNA, a region in DNA whereby uh, you can have synthesis of proteins in a, in, through the processes of uh, transcription and translation. So there's a starting point and there's an end point producing a single protein molecule known as, the, so this is known as a gene. So a gene is part of DNA. And you can have multiple genes, of course, on a stretch of DNA molecule. So that's gene number one, that's gene number two, and so on. So we all have the same genes on every single chromosome in the same order, all of us. So in, in chromosome one, I have gene A, gene B, gene C, gene D, etc. At, at certain positions. Now you, on chromosome one, you also have the same genes in the same order in the same location. Something else that I should emphasize on is that we are diploid. What, what we mean by diploid is that every cell, we're talking about somatic cells here, every cell contains two copies of every chromosome. Okay? So that's why we say we are diploid. And these chromosomes are homologous chromosomes, whereby one comes from the father and the other comes from the mother. Again, the sequence is almost similar. The order of genes is exactly the same. So all of our cells contain a, a pair of homologous chromosomes. Now germline cells, that is sperm and egg, contain single chromosomes, only one copy of each chromosome, um, and they are known as haploid cells. Okay, so remember, we are diploid. And this is basically the basis of inheritance patterns. That is, when, when a gene is dominant or recessive, for example, when a phenotype or a like uh, eye color or hair color or whatever uh, is, is different among individuals, even though they can have two different genes, you know, two different copies of genes, one from the mother and the other from the father. Okay, so um, I'm gonna end with uh, briefly talking about um, talking about um, uh, RNA, RNA ribonucleic acid. It is basically a single stranded molecule. It does not have a particular structure like DNA. DNA is double helical, but an RNA molecule may have different forms, different structures know the differences between DNA and RNA, okay? Now, within an RNA molecule, you can have hydrogen bonding between the bases if they are, note the word, if they are complementary to each other, okay? Now, um, in the past few years, there has been an explosion in the different types of RNA molecules that we have identified. So um, 
in, in the past, we learned that there are three types of RNA molecules, ribosomal RNA, rRNA, transfer RNA, tRNA, and messenger RNA, mRNA. But in the past few years, uh, we have discovered uh, different types of RNA molecules with different names and different functions, and we will not talk about all of these RNA molecules, but they are collectively known as non-coding RNA molecules, uh, NCRNA, non-coding RNA. What we mean by non-coding is that they do not code for proteins. So messenger RNA is a coding RNA because it codes for proteins. But non-coding RNAs do not. And there are different types of non-coding RNA molecules. We have long non-coding RNA. We have small different types of small non-coding RNA molecules. We will talk uh, about microRNA or miRNA later on during the course. Okay, But you don't have to know a lot of these since uh, they have been discovered recently and we don't know much about these non-coding RNA molecules. So this is the lecture, uh, the first lecture. I hope uh, it has been easy um, and uh, clear for you. Allah ma'akum.